Thank you, Greg. This is a graveyard shift, uh, like the waste hierarchy. Energy from waste is the last thing before landfill. So that's it. That's us. Why does it rock in the West? Who has an answer? What's rocking in the West? Okay. That one's for you. <laughs> Next one. There's at least two more. <laughs> okay, that's for myself. It's a working energy from waste policy and it's a willingness by councils to do something. Does energy from waste stink? No. Whoever said it? <laughs> that's a Swiss pocket knife. <laughs> 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 Is energy from waste for solution for everything? Okay. And I got three more little ones, so fight over it when I leave. I leave at 5.20 because I have a plane to catch. My apologies. Let's get going. Rockingham is a project together with two partners, being NEC and Tribe. This is what it will look like. It's a typical waste energy plant, not much architecture. Why? Because it's in a heavy industrial zone. And uh, money talks, bullshit walks, and uh, councils are ready to pay, but they're not ready to pay more than for landfill. So it's a cutthroat business, and uh, if you in that, then you minimize your architecture. Willingness to pay for architecture sounds good, but it's hardly the case so far. Obviously not in Australia, because that's one of the obviously first ones which will come over the line. This is the seating. Um, in the area around here is still a lot of land available, all heavy industrial. The three partners, obviously us, uh, eminent world leading EPC provider, amongst others, Dubai, 1.5 million tons, Moscow, 0.7 million, Istanbul, 1 million, Mexico to come, 1.6 million tons. 600 facilities worldwide, our partner, NEC, uh, who was holding the site and wanted to propose a gasification technology, invited us uh, because the Perth market was not willing to accept it. So we are building a moving great plant. And tribe finance, uh, advice and uh, structuring. What does it look like? You got the usual um, technical stuff. 300,000 tons, residual waste. So everything after recycling and composting, up to the councils to decide how much composting and recycling they want to do. 96% landfill diversion achieved by recycling of bottom ash and metals. We go to that in further detail later. Uh, flue gas treatment residues still go to landfill. Obviously no greenhouse gases from landfill. Highly energy efficient. It will actually be 28 megawatt producing, which is a net energy efficiency of 28%. Okay, here it is. <laughs> so typically we're talking about 25% in Australia, although not defined what the 25 is. This is 28 net production. So after re reducing, sorry, taking off the energy required for running it. So let's go into the detail how it looks like. <clears throat> Bay Bridge, that's where the trucks come in. Waste reception area at the back. The combustion line and the boiler, that's the highest bits, together with the stack. The flue gas treatment. Turbine hall, that's where we make the electricity from high pressure steam. Bottom ash, maturation, storage, recycling. The uh, treatment process. As usual, you have an administ administration and a visiting center, education. Energy from waste does not stink. Why doesn't it stink? Because once the waste is burned, obviously, there's nothing left to stink. However, beforehand, it can stink, and uh, you can even follow stinking trucks. However, when it comes to the tipping hall, the waste reception area, it is under negative air pressure, which is achieved by drawing air from that hole, the bunker, into the combustion. And obviously, once it comes out, it's clean because it's burned out. We are running at least 8,000 hours a year. That leaves at least 600 hours a year where we do not operate. 
So it could stink then because it doesn't go through a stack. So we have a little stack. And then we do the dilution is the solution principle. So on that little stack during the downtime, we will eject the air, but because it's at such a high level, uh, the residents won't get uh, annoyed. And again, we have all this air going in, and even with all doors open, there should no be air coming out. Some technical parameters, 102 megawatts for uh, technical guys, 8,000 hours, storage for four days, uh, storage for flue gas treatment residues. I will not annoy you with great details. Um, flue gas treatments, uh, state of the art, best available technology as it is being built in Europe, Japan, and overseas. How does it work in detail? We come in with residual waste and the additives for flue gas treatment, which is lime and activated carbon. Waste reception storage neg in, under negative air pressure. Air is used in the combustion. We got the boiler. We use the produced heat to make steam. Flue gas treatment residue. So the lime reacts with chlorine and sulfur. And activated carbon takes heavy metals and dioxins. Energy gets used, converted to electricity. In this case, only electricity because there's no heat off-taker. And we are producing aggregates and metals from a bottom ash treatment, which we'll follow in a little bit more detail later. Obviously, the clean flue gas and the flue gas treatment residues. This is the block fly diagram. And we're going to look now at the flue gas treatment and the bottom ash treatment in more detail. Dry scrubbing with hydrated lime, how do we do that? The flue gas comes around 150, 200 degrees from the boiler, and we are injecting lime and activated carbon uh, in a reactor that goes over fabric filter. That fabric filter is huge. It's much bigger than you would think it is if you take an average composition. And it is much bigger because waste is constantly changing. It is changing every hour, day, month, season, over the years. And it can even change in few seconds, depending on what is on the moving rate. So there is not one waste composition for an energy from waste plant. There is a wide range of energy, uh, of waste compositions. And this is why, without further comments, a like-for-like -like comparison to find a reference plant in Europe is a little bit difficult, but fortunately this is waste to energy in the West and not in New South Wales. So activated carbon is injected as well. The big fabric filter is oversized and always has some chemicals sticking on it. That means if there is coming a high concentration, it still gets absorbed and we buffer it. Nitrous oxides. Nitrous oxides react with ammonia all the chemical reactions are given here. There's an optimum window, which uh, we will always find. It's over 850 degrees Celsius. Um, and if you put in too much, that's when you get the ammonia slip. If you put it in at too low temperature, you get ammonia slip. If the temperature is too high, then you burn it and it doesn't react. This is why you have the optimum temperature. How can we be sure that this actually works? This is why we have an emission measurement. And we not only have one, we have a second one on standby. It's redundant. That's what the European legislation requires, and that's what we are following here as well. So it is constantly monitoring chlorine, lime, nitrous oxides. They are used to treat the flue gas, as just described beforehand. But we also have heavy metals, dioxins. For those materials, there is today no continuous emission measurement available. That's why it's discontinuous. And this is what it looks like. This is a reference plant UK, Buckinghamshire, Great Moor. Same size, very similar waste. On the left side, you see uh, the half hourly emissions. And on the right-hand side, you see the daily emissions. Um, if you're wondering why is NOx and 
hydrogen chloride at 90% of emission limits, that's a choice because what you have to achieve is to be below 100. We can go to 50% of nitrous oxides, but then we have to inject more ammonia. Ammonia costs money. If you're not required to do it, why should you do it? And similarly for chlorine, which then produces a neat line. Heavy metals, dioxins, this is the, these are the percentages of the emission limits. So one of the highest one is actually here, but on average, everything is around a couple of to maybe 10%. So I would suggest that's a pretty good value. Bottom ash. Bottom ash is around 20, 25% of the residual waste coming in. What we have in here are metals, broken glass, not recycled glass. Uh, we have stones, um, everything which doesn't burn. And it's not burning anymore. That, that is steam, what you see, just by the way. <laughs> so, bottom ash treatment, what does it look like? Bottom ash has been in the heat, so it's been burned. CO2 has been driven off, which means it's alkaline. So what we want to do in the first three, four weeks is only one thing. We absorb carbon dioxide from the air, which lowers the pH to neutral. And that means that heavy metals are more stable and don't get uh, dissolved anymore. Afterwards, we separate it, and that's, based, that's a straightforward construction demolition, MRF process. Um, take out the metals, oversized, crush it again, non-ferrous metals, aluminiums. If there's any paper plastic flake, we get them out as well. For example, if you have a book, phone book, you put that in, there's a high risk that it might still come out. Because it is so thick, it takes time to burn out. Typical screen sizes, 0 to 10, 10 to 40, which then go into recycling. Before we go, there are a few pictures, what it looks like. This is the process, screens, shredders, ferrous, non-ferrous removal. This is an example from a plant in Poland, uh, built for Suez. These are examples from the UK of such a plant, where we also see the aggregate fractions coming out. What you just saw is only the processing building enclosed and the maturation open. In the case of Rockingham, we have everything enclosed for processing, and the storage is enclosed on three sides. Main reason is we can have a lot of wind, we can have a lot of heat in Rockingham, so we don't want lift off of dust. Maybe that's super cautious, but that's what we decided to do, and that will assure that at all times there is no dust coming out. What is bottom ash all about? There are millions of tons recycled, recycled in Europe every year. It contains the metals, hardly any organics, and aggregate material. Its properties are that it has a lower density than normal aggregate material, correct, quarry material. Because we do it next to the center, uh, next to the use, because our plant is close to the city center, therefore we have fewer transports from outside. We don't need to quarry, we don't need to blow up the quarry. It actually, in total, it has a negative carbon footprint. And there are several uses, uh, which I just illustrate a little bit by a few pictures. So this gets marketed at a slight discount to virgin material uh, in the UK, and that's what we want to do in Rockingham as well. Complies with UK and European standards, there's a quality protocol around it, low energy embodied, sustainable, the project, 36 months to completion. We haven't started yet. The idea is to start the project end of this year. Why don't we do it earlier? The reason is we do not have so far sufficient waste quantity secured. Uh, we need a little bit more to uh, get our finance together. Uh, we have one contract with EMRC, 
We have been selected by Coburn. We did win MRC as well, but unfortunately they did not procure. Um, and there's some more tenders coming out very soonish. So we're hopeful it's happening by end of this year. What could it look like? This is an example from Fair Beach, UK, uh, of a construction site. Um, and we have a strong emphasis on workers' health and safety, high quality office and welfare, because happy workers makes happy work, more productivity, less accidents. Segregation on a work site is everything. So that's what we try to do. We pre-build lots of things on the site and then we bring it together and crane them in. This is at a further stage in Ferrybridge. So what's Rockingham all about? It's a vision of WA to actually accept energy from waste, to do the studies on a state level, to get EPA on board to do it. accepting European standards, securing contracts, long-term contracts with council, and a council which is actually procuring. It's not that easy to get uh, such contracts over line. We do not have a pay, take or pay structure, so council only has to deliver what they have as residual waste. If council improves recycling or wants to do more composting, that's fine with us. The only obligation they have is to bring this residual waste. So it's not feeding the bees that's proved by some of the energy from waste friends. So what we really try to be support is if anybody finds it, a higher order use, please go for it. We're not going to stop you and punish you. So I mentioned we have preferred tender by city of Coburn as well. And uh, that's also for a 20-year contract. And what they said is it is environmentally friendly compared with landfill. And on top of that, they get the option to get renewable energy and baseline for that point. So this is my presentation. I think we have.